the uh, uh, this morning's uh, tutorial for the boot camp will it'll be on uh, lower bound techniques in proof complexity and Pavel Gruvesh will give the talk. <coughs> so, uh, good morning. Uh, so I'll be talking about lower bounds in uh, proof complexity. <coughs> So first I will tell you a little bit about what proof complexity is about. So uh, it depends, probably the motivation depends on which background you would come from. But like I uh, originally studied mathematical logic where the key question is the following. You have a proof system P and you want to know which theorems are provable in that system. In proof complexity you ask a different question. You have a proof system you know that something is provable in the system you know and you want to know how hard it is to prove something in the system how short are the proofs or long are the proofs of whatever you are interested in now if your background is computer science then the motivation should be that in computer uh, science you are interested in how hard is it to compute something here you are interested in how hard is it to prove something now the central object that uh, people study in this context is the so-called propositional proof system, which is abstractly defined as follows. So in your proof system, something has a proof, and you're interested in proof systems that prove propositional tautologies. So something has a proof only if it is a propositional tautology. That's one property that you demand from it. And the second property that you require is that if somebody gives you a proof, you can actually check efficiently whether the proof is a correct proof or not. So this is an abstract definition, but I'll give you some examples. So uh, my favorite example is the so-called Frege system. Uh, the favorite system, I think, of everybody else is resolution. <laughs> then. Uh, Another proof system I'll talk about a bit is called the cutting planes. And another example would be ZFC, which is a very abstract theory, uh, which proves a lot of things about large cardinals and or not proves things about large cardinals. But if you restrict ZFC only to talk about propositional tautologies, what it can prove in propositional logic, it also becomes a proof system. And as such is probably the most powerful system that we so far know. Now, uh, <clears throat> the Frege system looks as follows. So it's uh, the usual textbook axiomatization of propositional calculus. Now it depends which textbooks you have. Uh, so one way how to axiomatize it is the following. You have only one rule which says that from A implies B and A, you can infer B. Which means that if you have proved A implies B and you have proved A, you can also prove B. And then you have a bunch of axioms. And the axioms are as follows. Now, <coughs> this doesn't look very appealing because, uh, for example, I don't remember uh, what the axioms exactly are. And I'm not 100% sure if I didn't add one extra axiom or didn't forget some axiom. But the point of this is that uh, uh, the definition is very robust. So if you decide to add an extra axiom, like for example, I think the axiom A or not A. Uh, just use a different color. So A or not A. Huh. A or not A <coughs> is not among these things. But if I decide to add it as an extra axiom, the power of the system in terms of the length of proofs stays pretty much the same. It uh, changes only by a constant factor. Similarly, if I decide to add uh, some more connectives like parity gates or your favorite Boolean function and add a bunch of new axioms governing uh, uh, this new connective, the strength of the system stays the same. So it's a very, very robust system. And uh, as such, it's very nice to work with. finite set of two things? Yes. Okay. Yeah, basically, but uh, uh, sort of, if I, there is a, actually, this is an example of a Frege system, but there is a notion of 
general class of systems which is called Frege systems, which have the property that you have a finite list of axioms of this kind and a finite list of inference rules, and that's called Frege systems. And then you can show that in terms of lengths of proofs, all of those Frege systems are equivalent. Uh, so, so lengths of proofs, and in particular, if there's a finite length proof in one, there's a finite length proof. Yes, yeah. and also that. So if there is a proof in one, there is a proof in another. And if there is a short proof in one, there is a short proof in, in another. Uh, but uh, the abstract definition would take too long for me to, to explain. So that's the Frege system. <coughs> Another system is resolution. And resolution is actually not a proof system as I defined it, but it's a refutation system. So instead of proving that something is uh, a tautology, which means it's satisfied by every assignment, you prove that something is uh, a contradiction, that it's never satisfiable. And you also work only with unsatisfiable CNFs. So the resolution system looks as follows. So the basic uh, objects that resolution works with are clauses, which are just uh, disjunctions or variables or their negations. And for simplicity, you just think of the disjunction as a set of variables and their negations. And you have only one resolution rule, which says that uh, from you can start with two clauses. If they sh one has a variable and uh, that one has a negative variable, you can remove the variable and form the union. So that's the only rule. And a resolution refutation of a set of clauses is that you start with your clauses that you want to refute, and you form new clauses by the resolution rule until you reach the empty clause, which is obviously unsatisfying. So that's what a resolution refutation is. Sometimes it's more convenient uh, <coughs> actually to think about resolution refutations in terms of trees, uh, in terms of graphs. So you, uh, resolution refutation starts, you start with your initial clauses, C1 through CM. Those are the things you want to refute. And then you form new clauses uh, from the initial clauses by the resolution rule. And then you can combine them again, combine them again, until you reach the empty clause, which is unsatisfiable. And this uh, provides a witness for unsatisfiability of the, uh, of the set of clauses. Oh. Uh. <coughs> and similarly, if you are talking about CNFs, so uh, a CNF, which is a conjunction of disjunction, is unsatisfiable. Uh, sorry. So a, re a refutation of a CNF is just a refutation of the clauses appearing in the CNF. <coughs> so one important observation about uh, the uh, resolution proof system is that it is sound and complete, meaning that if you manage to refute a set of clauses, then the clauses are actually unsatisfiable. And if a set of clauses is unsatisfiable, then actually there exists a resolution refutation. This is a fairly simple proof, but I will not, not show it. I will talk a lot about resolution, because in terms of what people can prove, resolution is uh, the weakest, most, and at the same time, interesting proof system. So at the same time, it's interesting, and you can also prove a bunch of things about it. So resolution will appear a lot in this talk. So I hope it's clear what the resolution is. So another example that I'll mention a little bit will be cutting planes, which looks a little bit like resolution, except the objects that it works with are not uh, clauses, that is disjunctions, but they are linear inequalities with integer coefficients. And uh, you can think of representing a clause in terms of a linear inequality. And I guess this should be greater or equal to one. So <coughs> uh, 
which is clearly over 0, 1 assignments, those two expressions are equivalent. So you think of translating uh, clauses, that is disjunctions, as linear inequalities. And you have a bunch of rules. Now, the, the, you have two rules which are sort of evident. Uh, the first one is once you have derived an inequality, you can multiply it by a non-negative number and the outcome is still valid. You can add two inequalities, that's the second rule. And the uh, interesting rule is uh, the rounding rule, which basically tells you that you are working with the variables are intended to be integers. So like one application of the rule would be, suppose that you have some, somewhere derived 2x is greater or equal to 1. And suppose I intend to work over uh, integers. So I know that x is an integer. So if, if x is greater or equal to 1, this means that x must be at least 1, okay? Because x is an integer. So it is the third rule that uh, guarantees that we are working with uh, inequalities over integer valued variables. And cutting plane's refutation is what you would expect. So you start with uh, the inequalities, uh, the uh, initial inequalities, and you obtain new inequalities by means of the three previous rules until you get a contradiction that zero is greater or equal to one. And that guarantees, in this case, this would guarantee that uh, the original inequalities we have have no integer solutions. However, I'm interested in propositional tautologies that is in the zero one assignments to the variables. So if I'm talking about a CNF and I want to say that the CNF has, is unsatisfiable, meaning it has no zero one solutions, not only that, that you have no integer solutions, then what you will do, you will take the clauses in the CNF, you will form their translations into linear inequalities. But you will also add the Boolean axioms saying that every variable is between 0 and 1 uh, as additional axioms. And one can prove that, uh, again, uh, cutting planes is complete in the following, sound and complete in the following sense, that if a formula has a cutting plane refutation, then it is unsatisfiable. And if it is unsatisfiable, then it also has cutting planes refutation. Yes. Okay. Th th this is actually the completeness of cutting planes is an interesting issue, and I am omitting references. But to prove this theorem, it's enough to show that cutting planes simulates resolution. So I, I already showed you how to translate how to translate an inequality uh, a clause into an inequality so you replace uh, replace x or y or not z as the uh, inequality above so if you take a resolution refutation and you apply this translation line by line you will get a cutting planes refutation so cutting planes simulates resolution so that's one way how to prove completeness. On the other hand, uh, when Chvatel uh, uh, designed this system originally, uh, he was not uh, talking about CNF formulas, but about general sets of linear inequalities over integers. And there, there is also a completeness theorem saying that if, uh, if a set of linear inequalities has no integer solutions, then it also has a cutting plane's refutation. But that proof is much, much more complicated and you cannot obtain it by reduction to resolution because resolution talks only about zero one solutions. Similarly, if you talk about a set of linear inequalities which are not translations of clauses, then also the proof is mo more difficult. So I'm making my life easy in this uh, statement by assuming that the clauses I'm working with are translations of, uh, of clauses. <coughs> And so 
So those were some examples of like proof systems I will talk about. Frega system, resolution, cutting planes. <coughs> and now back to the original <coughs> question of what people want to do in proof complexity. So this is another definition. So you have a proof system, which can be one of the uh, systems I uh, previously described. And the question you want to know whether uh, there are some hard formulas, which whether there are hard formulas to prove in the system. So you want to know, in particular, whether there exists a polynomial such that every polynomial size formula, every formula of size S, has a, a proof of size polynomial in S in that system. Okay, so that system we would call polynomially bounded. It's a system in which everything has a short proof. Now, <clears throat> the basic question that you ask in proof complexity is that given a, your favorite proof system P, is that system polynomially bounded? That's basically the question. Or in other words, you want to show that the system is not polynomially bounded, meaning that there exists a tautology which is hard to prove in the system, which, uh, which requires super polynomial size proofs. And the general belief is that no polynomially bounded proof system exists because uh, by the following uh, theorem, polynomially bounded proof system exists if and only if NP is equal to coin. So in general, any system you think of, as long as it satisfies the uh, definition of the propositional proof system should not be polynomially bounded. <coughs> To see this is quite straightforward. So basically, the definition of propositional proof system means the following. It is a propositional proof system is a non-deterministic Turing machine, which is supposed to solve a coin p complete problem, which is of deciding whether something is a tautology. <coughs> so it's a non-deterministic Turing machine solving a coin p complete problem. And the fact that it's polynomially bounded means that the non-deterministic Turing machine runs in non-deterministic polynomial time, which means that uh, there exists a polynomially bounded proof system if and only if NP is equal to coin P. It's just an application of the definition. <coughs> Nevertheless, it means that uh, for the systems that I mentioned before, they should not be polynomially bounded unless NP is equal in your, in your system, so all the rules are, are very simple. So if MP is equal to P, can you, can you construct a, a proof system with just local rules, like like Frege like no. So is that, is that not important? Uh, I, I can't. <laughs> uh, and I don't think it's possible. Um, I don't think it's possible. Well, okay, okay, if NP is equal to QNP and you show me a very simple proof that NP is equal to QNP, then maybe later I'll be able to adapt the proof to construct some nice proof system. I think the way to get the transition of the machine, some other and make a system which, no, the, the, uh, so, yeah. so, well, you know, the, the, if the lines of your proof are, are uh, ins uh, instantaneous descriptions of a computation or something like this. Well, uh, sure, yes, but like I, I thought you mean nice like nice, like so, something. <laughs> I would just, I would just, I would just ask for localities. I mean, can you make like a rule? As Paul, as Paul said, like the tape of the machine would be like lines on your proofs, and then the rules would be just the transitions on the tape. So it would be local because Turing machines are local. But it will be different from everything we've seen because we'll be defining new variables as it goes along. Yeah, it, it wouldn't look like what we had before. Probably it's equivalent to whether NP equals co-NP is provable in some kind of system of bounded arithmetic, which you don't really want to talk about, but... Yes. So if your definition of nice is being provable in the... Uh, some So here are some classical results that uh, people know. So resolution system 
as I define it, is not polynomial bounded. So there are things which are hard to prove in resolution. That's good. The similar thing is true for cutting planes. And another thing is true for bounded depth frag. I didn't define what bounded depth frag was, but I, I defined what frag was. So imagine that you have frag, as we had before, but you insist that all the formulas appearing in the proof have constant depth, let's say 100. Uh, otherwise, the rules would be pretty much the same. So we are working with formulas of bounded depth. And for that, uh, I type proved that bounded depth frag is also not exponentially bounded. Uh, I will not talk about this result, but if you become interested, this is probably the most interesting and by far the strongest result in proof complexity ever. This is the gem of proof complexity, and it was proved like 30 years ago, and it's still the gem in proof complexity. Uh, but the proof is rather involved, and I will not talk about it. But there are many more proof systems for, this, which is, uh, for which this is not known. For example, for Frege system, we don't know. So the main open problem would be, is the Frege system polynomial bounded? So for all that we know, it could be the case that every uh, tautology has a polynomial size Frege proof. That's... Can I just ask for some uh, more details? So when you said uh, Frege, you described it as A, implies B and A implies A, etc. Cetera, et cetera. What type of objects are A and B? Are A and B formulae? Yes, a, in Frege, A and B are formulas. And, and how many variables are these? Uh, there is no... Uh, so maybe I should have explained that better, but... Uh, so Frege had like rules, like axioms like A implies B implies A. The meaning of this is that it is a... It's not a single axiom, it's a scheme. So for A, you are allowed to substitute anything you want. So you are allowed to, let's say, if x and y are variables, so you are allowed to use this as an axiom. I see. Okay. Okay. So any instance of this, whatever you substitute for a and b, like this, for example, is also an axiom which you can use in your proof. And similarly for all the other axioms. Now, when measuring, there are different ways how to measure the size of the proof. But uh, the size of the proof would be just the size of each application of the axiom in the proof. So like this would have size like f. And when you say it's bounded depth, A and B have to be bounded depth. Yes. And of course, uh, uh, bounded depth would mean uh, with conjunctions and disjunctions of arbitrary Fenin. Uh, the rules I stated before were on only for Fenin 2 but you can easily ad adapt it to, uh, to accommodate like, a higher frame. And is bounded depth the same as AC0 frame? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say that, but uh, then I realized I never remember whether it's AC or ACC, and then uh, <laughs> it's usually called bounded depth. So, uh, but the motivation for bounded depth frag, so, uh, you can think of Aitai's lower bound as like a really sophisticated way how to translate lower bounds on Boolean circuits of bounded depth into the language of proof complexity. So there is a lower bound for bounded depth circuits for parity. And now you sort of extend and adapt and work a lot to use this lower bound for proofs, which work only with bounded depth circuits or formulas. And uh, that's <clears throat> and the way how those results go is that you, the favorite CNF that uh, people work with is the so-called pigeonhole principle, which is an unsatisfiable CNF, which says that there is an injection from n plus 1. So here you have a size of n plus 1. N. And you think of the variables x, i, j as saying that the i-th pigeon goes to j-th hole. 
And now we have a bunch of clauses which say that uh, uh, so there is this big clause uh, which says that for every i there exists an j such that xij is true, which means that every pigeon goes to some hole. So that's the first clause. And then you have clauses which say that for every hole, it's not true that there are two pigeons sitting in the hole. So that's a CNF which is trying to assert that there is a, an injection from set of size n plus 1 to set of size n, which is clearly unsatisfied. So that's a nice unsatisfiable CNF. And the lower bound for resolution goes by saying that uh, pigeonhole principle is actually an example of a hard thing to refute in, in a resolution. Aita's lower bound that I mentioned before is that pigeonhole principle requires uh, exponential size bounded depth fragger proof. Now I apologize about the negations uh, because Resolution is a refutation system when you are refuting things, and Frege system is a system where you are proving things. I didn't invent it, uh, but it's confusing. Uh, <coughs> but uh, when you want to prove lower bounds for stronger proof systems, pigeonhole principle no longer works. So you can show that uh, the pigeonhole principle, as stated, has a short refutation in the full Frege system, and it also has a short refutation in the cutting planes proof system. So this is the overview of the <coughs> classical results. Okay, thank you, Paul. I'm uh, sloppy with references, so actually, I type proved a super polynomial row bounds uh, for pigeonhole principle, which was later improved by Paul and and plenty of other people to truly exponential lower bounds. And also simplify the proof uh, quite a lot. The original proof of ITA is uh, beautiful but completely incomprehensible. Yes? <laughs> is there a conjectured hard problem for general fragment for cutting planes? But for cutting planes, we do know lower bounds. So uh, for cutting planes, there is a modification of the pigeonhole principle, for example, that I will talk about, which is hard for cutting planes, uh, which is the same principle except you encode it in a slightly different way, which will work in cutting planes. For Frege, that's a very interesting question. So, like, uh, coming up with hard candidates for Frege system is a good question. I don't know about many. The only thing I know, I think, would be the following tautology, so, uh, which comes from algebra. Uh, so suppose you have two matrices A times B. We satisfy uh, square matrices that A times B is the identity. So that means that B times A is the identity. So, yes? Uh, and let's say we are working over GF2 to make life easier so that we don't have to worry how to encode uh, numbers in, uh, as Boolean strings. So over GF2, this is clearly a tautology. But uh, as far as I know, the, uh, the best upper bound on the size of proofs of this is quasi-polynomial in N. So this is one possible candidate to prove uh, <coughs> lower bounds for Frege. But if I were to conjecture, I would guess that this is actually easy in Frege and you should probably spend time to prove an upper bound in Frege and show, show that the, uh, you can prove this by polynomial size proof. But I don't know this. Uh, so this might be hard for Frege. What is the strongest lower bound that people have in Frege? N plus 1 is known? Well, it's uh, N squared. Uh, but it, this depends on how you measure the proof size. So if, if you are interested in the total size of a proof, then, uh, then the, the lower bound is n squared. If you are interested in the number of lines, 
then the lower bound is n, or maybe O of n. And the, the, I will tell you what the lower bound is, and you will see how silly it is. So you take just some favorite tautology that you have, which will be just the constant 1, and then you add a bunch of negations in front of it. <laughs> and you will make an even number of negations. Okay? And now you will ask Frege's system to prove that this is actually equal to 1. And, it, and since the, the rules in the Frege system are sort of local, so the, the system can read at most like 1, 2 <laughs> negations at a time, so this will require, if like the number of negations here is n, this will re require roughly n lines to prove in the system. But each line will be roughly of size n, because that's what's going on here. One modus ponens of what you had before? Uh, excuse me? When you say line, you just mean one application of Yes, yes, ponens. yes, okay. Uh, yes, so, so... So linear is the best at okay. Yeah, uh, on the number of lines, it's linear. If you are measuring the total size, it's quadratic, and it's sort of silly. So, like, one open problem is for Frege to prove a lower bound. Uh, if you decide to m measure the number of inferences, uh, meaning the, the number of lines in the proof, then to prove superlinear lower bounds, like something. I think the official open problem is n to 1 plus epsilon lower bound, but I don't think that even n times log n or something is known. So even that would be an open problem. But <coughs> Exact Frege, Frege systems are equivalent up to polynomials. So, yes. that you'd have to actually fix the system. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, a kind of tedious, like with formula lower bounds, okay? So, if you, if you prove super polynomial lower bounds on formulas, then it doesn't matter what basis you are working with. But if you prove like really weak lower bound, then it matters uh, over which basis you are working. So, for Frege, if you prove superponent on the lower bound, it doesn't matter. If you prove something this week, you have to fix your system. So it's like less exciting. But this lower bound works for any fragment that you have. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is to like, prove the and is commutative or something like this. It's just yeah. a or something. Yes. <laughs> This implied Boolean circuit lower bounds? No. But I don't know, but uh, no, not that I know. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So whether there is a connection between proof complexity lower bounds for Frege and circuit lower bounds. So as far as I know, there is no like direct one-to-one -one connection between the two. But uh, you can show that if you prove lower bounds of a certain form for Frege, then you will get circuit lower bounds. But unconditionally, I don't know this. If you're just doing lines, uh, some of your lines in Frege could get exponentially long, so you'd have to be careful about, uh, if you're just counting lines, it's like extended Frege. Yes, uh, that's true. Well, th there are like other proof systems, like extended Frege, which actually would capture the number of lines and not the size. <coughs> anyway, uh, before I guess I move to the like the uh, lower bound techniques. Uh, uh, let me make like uh, two like general observations about the proof complexity. So, one <coughs> uh, thing which is strange. Oh. One, uh, one thing which is strange is that for Frege system, and actually for most proof systems that I haven't mentioned, we don't know how to prove lower bound. So we don't know whether they are polynomially bounded or not. Uh, which is a little bit weird because the uh, a fixed proof system like Frege is just like a specific non-deterministic tuning machine. So now if you are in the situation that somebody comes to you and gives you an algorithm and he says this algorithm solves SAT in polynomial time, then usually you will find the bug eventually and uh, you will see that either it doesn't solve SAT or it does not run, run in polynomial time. And, 
and you will find it pretty soon. But if I come to you and say Frege is polynomially bounded, meaning that everything is a short proof in Frege, it's very hard to prove me wrong, even though it's a very similar situation. And the reason is only because Frege system is a non-deterministic Turing machine. So it's the non-determinism which is the hard part. So one particular formula can have many, many different proofs, and you want to say that among all this infinitude of possible proofs, none of them is short. That's like the problem. So even for, <coughs> for specific proof systems, the question of is it polynomially bounded or not is a hard question, typically. Uh, that's one observation. The second observation is that uh, the field of proof complexity contains many proof systems. I mentioned three so far, but there are at least like 50 more proof systems which are well studied in literature. And if you just decide to invent your own proof system, probably you will invent a proof system which nobody else has studied before. And all, a lot of those proof systems are comparable in the sense that if you have short proof in one, then you have a short, uh, that you can simulate one by another. So if you have short proofs in this one, you will have short proofs in that one but you don't know the converse, but a lot of them are totally incomparable. We don't know what's the relationship with them. So there are like a lot of systems. And if you prove a lower bound on one, then you uh, don't know anything about what's going to happen in the other one, etc. So this uh, can be a little bit frustrating because you are working in one little thing, which at the end like implies nothing about other things. But potentially if you are like, trying to find interesting problems to work on and publish some papers, then this is also nice because you can find some, your favorite <laughs> proof system about which you can prove something. But uh, why does it happen? Like this doesn't happen in, let's say, circuit complexity, okay? In circuit complexity, we should, we probably all agree that like Boolean circuit, that's the one computational model or Turing machine, two computational models that we really care about. And the other models of computation we introduce is out of necessity, because we cannot prove things about Boolean circuits, so we define some restrictions. In proof complexity is a different situation. And one reason, I guess, is because that there is no, or we don't know whether there is an optimal proof system, which is some th a system which would simulate all the proof systems. So when I mentioned the ZFC proof system, it probably simulates all the proof systems we know, because as mathematicians, we work in ZFC. But uh, we, we don't know whether the, the ZFC proof system simulates every possible propositional proof system. And it's an open problem whether there exists some universal proof system or not. If such a proof system existed, then we could all talk about this one beautiful proof system and try to prove lower bounds for that. But we don't even know that such a system exists. And it's actually believed that such a system does not exist, that it's necessary to have many different uh, proof systems. <coughs> so, uh, so now I will move to resolution. And I will, I guess, give a sketch for, uh, or, uh, of a lower bound for resolution proof system. But in fact, I think all the proof sketches of lower bounds I will give will be for resolution. Because it's, a, it's the simplest proof system. And if you have some beautiful idea about how to prove lower bounds, then the idea should better work for resolution. And if you make it work for resolution, maybe you will make it work so for something else. So as an uh, illustration how lower bound techniques work or might work, resolution is a good testing ground. <clears throat> I actually, uh, I will give a proof which I consider like the simplest how to prove lower bound for resolution, but I'm not 100% sure that this will turn out to be the case. And it's a proof which comes from Ben Sassen and Wittgerson which in turn is based on earlier ideas of Ben Sasson and Russell and many others. Uh, I 
Ja, dann probieren wir mal Kalkus. Ja, das ist eigentlich ein Nachbild, das ist so. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. So. First, a few defi definitions. So, if you have a clause, which is a disjunction of variables, so, uh, you define its width as simply the number of variables in, uh, in the clause. Literal, I guess I haven't defined. Literal means a variable or its negation. So width of a clause is just the size of the clause. Uh, the next thing you consider is the width of a resolution proof. The width of a resolution proof is the size of the largest clause uh, appearing in the, in the proof. And finally, this uh, W bar will be the smallest case such that you can refute the set of clauses C in width at most K. <coughs> and the, the theorem is the following. That if you have a set of clauses C, which contain n variables, then the number of... Uh, just, this is a typo, just to make sure. Yeah, it's the largest. Less than or equal to. It's the smallest K. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the, the end of the line, just before the last character. Yeah. The largest K. Oh, the smallest? Yeah, it should be the other way. No, then, uh, yes, the smallest K. Uh, sorry, at most. At most. This is zero. <laughs> oh, good, okay. <laughs> it's, it's certainly, be, uh, it's the smallest K. No, no, it's smallest, but yeah. yeah. I think it's correct, actually. <laughs> it may be confusing, but it's correct. <laughs> Oh, oh, now I'm totally confused, but do, do you know do you know what it means? <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so, so, so it, you take a fixed refutation, you find the largest clause, call it K, and then you take the minimum of all the refutations of an overall case. Okay. So, yeah, just change that bigger and equal to less than or equal to. No, 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 no every clause. No, yeah, whatever. So, here's a theorem of uh, Ben Sasson and Vigerson that, uh, that you can lower bound the size of a resolution refutation. Here by size, I mean just the number of uh, lines in the refutation, the number of applications of the resolution rule is at least this quantity. But uh, in, in practice, what you will do is that you will start uh, with a set of clauses which themselves will have a pretty small width. So ideally like three CNFs. So we'll have clauses which everything has width at most three. So this number is pretty small. It will be a constant. Now, if you are working in n variables, uh, potentially the number of clauses, uh, the, the width of a clause in n variables can be up to n. And if you manage to show that when you start with those really small clauses, like of size three, then in every refutation, there has to be like a pretty big clause, like a clause of size, let's say, n over two, then in every refutation there will be a clause of size at least n over 2, for example. Then you plug it into that bound and you will get a lower bound of like n over 2 squared over n, which is like n, and you will get a lower bound of 2 to the n. So that's the idea. So uh, if, if every refutation must contain a big clause, then you must uh, have a large refutation. <coughs> 
Now, there is a different version of the statement which is a little bit better for tree-like proofs. Now, tree-like pr proofs I'll discuss later. Tree-like proof in resolution means that if you look at this graph of the proof, the graph is actually a tree. Uh, meaning that once you have derived something, you can, apply, you can use it at most once and you are not allowed to recycle it. Uh, general resolution proofs don't uh, look like tree-like proofs. Uh, tree-like proofs are simpler to, to understand and also the lower bound you are getting is better. <clears throat> so, so Pavel, just to make sure I understand, W is just the maximum class length in the input instance. Yes. And W bar is in the entire refutation proof. Yes. Okay, so that's the difference that we're looking at. Yes. Okay. Uh, sh should I write the confusing definition again, or are we okay? Uh, <clears throat> so I was planning on proving this. Uh, the proof is not difficult, but I don't uh, think I will get to it. I will instead I will show you an application of this lower bound. Uh, so far, it looks only like a reduction of size of proofs to, to like the notion of width. But the point of this reduction is that it's much easier to understand width than size, and it's actually easy to come up with examples of CNFs which require large width. And one example is the uh, bit pigeonhole principle. Uh, <clears throat> so remember the pigeonhole principle I had before, yes? So if WFC is large to start with, is there a way to translate the, the statement so that it's small? Like the do for set? Generically, I don't think so, but there are like tricks, okay, how to do that. So now, uh, pigeonhole principle. I will now talk about different version, but pigeonhole principle, as I defined it originally, you cannot really apply this bound because you are already starting with clauses which are too huge. So that's not going to work. That's why I will modify it a little bit. But uh, what Anup is asking is whether there is some black box way how to do this. I don't know about it. But for pigeonhole principle, there is a trick how to do it. So here is your pigeonhole principle. And the problem is with the wide clauses. There is a clause for every pigeon which says that it goes to at least one hole, which contains n variables. Now, let's instead uh, fix some particular graph, which will be sparse. And instead of saying every pigeon must go to some hole here, let's say that this pigeon goes just to the neighborhood of this point in this graph. And if the graph is sparse, then you will end up with uh, CNFs of small width. And if you choose your graph cleverly, meaning an expander graph, then uh, actually the uh, lower bound will go through. So there is a trick that you can apply to the pigeonhole principle. <clears throat> so the bit pigeonhole principle looks as follows. So you will have uh, a huge matrix size 2 to the n plus 1 times n. And and the CNF will say that all the rows in this matrix are distinct, which is clearly a contradiction because there are at most 2 to the n 0 1 rows that you can build out of n. And here we have 2 to the n plus 1 of these. So in particular, you will have variables for the entries of the matrix. And now for given two distinct rows of the matrix, you will have a 2CNF, which says that uh, the given two rows are distinct. I will leave it up to you to write down the 2NCNF. Two, two 
it's obvious such a CNF exists because <coughs> you are talking about two n variables here. And the bit PHP just says that all the rows of this matrix are distinct. Now, do, do, the reason why I call it uh, bit PHP is that there is a different way how to think about it. So, uh, think about it as a pigeonhole principle from n plus 1 to n, as we had before. But now, instead of having a variable which tells me where does the ith pigeon go to, you will have a variable which gives you the bit representation of the hole that the pigeon that uh, or that the pigeon goes to. So you can think of the variable xij as giving you the jth bit of the hole that the ith pigeon goes to. So it's the same sort of pigeonhole principle, except that you are not giving the function as its graph, but in terms of the bit representation. And the advantage here is mainly that uh, you have altogether uh, exponentially many variables, 2 to the n, but the uh, clauses are relatively narrow. The, the clauses have like log n variables, where n is the total number of uh, variables. <coughs> and so if, we, if this makes sense, I just want to apply this bound, and I hope it doesn't upset you too much. So if you handle this smaller than k, then it will not upset you that this n is different than the n over there. So n over there is the total number of variables. This n is just my parameter n. So I hope you can play with it. So the way how it's defined, the, uh, the width of the initial clauses is 2n. It's pretty small. And now I want to say that the width of the pigeonhole principle, that every refutation of the bit pigeonhole principle must contain at least n minus 1 clauses, capital N minus 1 clauses. And <coughs> it's very easy to see. Probably not in the next uh, three minutes. But the uh, sketch of, of the argument would be the following. So uh, assume that you have like your refutation. And here we have uh, those initial clauses, which are the and <coughs> now if you have a clause C, you, <coughs> uh, you think about how many pigeons the, uh, the clause talks about. So remember that like the bit pigeonhole principle, I think about it as saying that given a variable xij, which are the variables, uh, I think of it as giving me the jth bit of the whole corresponding to the ith pigeon. So, you say that MC is the set of pigeons uh, C talks about. <coughs> Meaning that uh, it contains some variable that man mentions the pigeon. Okay. And I want to claim that uh, in every refutation there exists a clause which talks about <coughs> which talks about at least n minus one pitch. So no matter what refutation you have if it is a correct refutation, there will be some clause which contains, uh, talks about at least n minus conclusions. And the proof is very, <coughs> maybe I should leave it as an exercise. <coughs> but uh, basically, 
<coughs> so you have your refutation. And what you do is that you construct a path which starts from the empty clause, P0, P1, P2, etc. And adds at some initial clause. Uh, and for every, every clause on the path, you construct, a, so given a clause in this path, you construct uh, uh, some partial injection, which is a partial injection from the number of pigeons that the clause talks about into n. And, uh, and this injection will have the property that uh, actually the clause pi, if you evaluate it on this injection, is actually false. So, so the variables in PI talk about pigeons and some bits of the holes that the pigeon is, uh, is moved to. Now, you will construct a particle injection, which is from the set of pigeons that talks about into N, such that the clause is false. Okay. The way how you do that is that you do it inductively. So, uh, on. What does it mean that clause is false? What? Uh, about this injection? So, I'm. So, this condition says that uh, every pigeon that the clause PI talks about is mapped somewhere by the injection, which means that every variable in that clause is totally determined by my injection. So I just evaluate the clause on this, on this row, and it means that it's false. So you substitute zeros once, and you get zero. Okay? So uh, it's, it's important that everything that the clause talks about is completely de determined by the injection. Now, to construct this uh, is you start with P0, and this row zero will be just empty. Because this original thing talks about nothing. Now, if you have already constructed like pi somewhere, uh, to do it higher so that it can be seen. Uh, so if you have already constructed pi somewhere here, and, and now look at uh, how was it formed in your resolution proof. So it could be formed by resolution of. Uh, two clauses like C or X, L, M, and C not, not X, L. And now we already have an injection which makes this false. Okay? Now, <coughs> now look at the pigeon which is resolved here. So th this clause, those two clauses co talk uh, about the pigeon L. Now, if L is a pigeon which PI already talks about, what you do is that you simply, uh, this is false under the injection you already have, which means that at least one of the two things must be false in the injection, in the injection you have. That's how resolution works. So and at least one of the things must be false. So you just, if this is false, let's say, so you just inject, extend this, the path over here. That's one thing. And, and that's important, you take the restriction of your function to the set of pigeon this clause talks about. Okay? So you guarantee the property that this is false. And the, uh, and you have an injection from the number of pigeons into into N. That's one case. Another case is that if you are in the case that L is actually a pigeon that this does not mention. So <coughs> now I'm assuming, ah, I haven't told you. So you have a value that you have in use. Yes. Uh, 
I'm, I'm working by contradiction. I'm assuming that every clause is shorter than n minus 1. Now, if this is actually shorter, it talks about less than, at most, n minus 1 pigeons, then there is one value I haven't used. I can in extend the injection to this one extra pigeon. And again, I'm in the situation that at least one of the two things will be false. I move to this one, which is false, and I restrict the injection. So I never exceed n minus 1 in, in the calculation. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> now that you have that, this is a contradiction. Because when you get to an initial clause, uh, the initial clause should be false under the injection I've constructed. But the initial clause talks only about two pigeons. And it says that the two pigeons are distinct. Now, I've constructed an inj injection, so the two points are distinct. And the initial clause is actually true, which is a contradiction. So that means that uh, every refutation of the bit pigeonhole principle must contain, a, must contain a clause which talks about at least n minus 1 pigeons proving this bound. If this is confusing, think about it for three minutes and it will be clear. And finally, uh, if you just plug it into this formula, uh, so this is like capital N, this is like small n, which is like log n, and this n is the total number of variables, which is like n, capital N times n, and you get uh, a lower bound of this size. So that's, that's it for more. Uh, that's just, uh, you are not coming back? Oh, <laughs> no. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess we can, uh, we'll have, let's take questions at the beginning oh. after the, well, should we do questions now or just take a break now and do uh, a People question? People have been asking questions all along. Yeah, okay, so let's, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be back, we'll take a break now and start again at 11.